All right, guys, welcome back to the fifth key knowledge dot point in this third outcome in unit three. This one is all about materials strategies. OK, so here is our study design, as always. And here's the key knowledge dot point that we are looking at. Yeah. <clears throat> so strategies to improve both the efficiency and effectiveness of operations related to materials, including, and then it gives us four specific strategies. So once again, we have a very definite script. Those strategies are the only ones that you can be questioned on, and they're the only ones that you should use in any responses. So look, in the last video, the last key knowledge dot point, we looked at technology strategies and how they optimize operations in terms of efficiency, effectiveness. Those were the six that we looked at there. So all we're doing now is moving on. I said in that, that, that video there, we're looking at four different um, areas um, of strategies. So in this second area, we're looking at materials. Um, so we're just gonna go through basically the same process in this video with these four strategies that we did with those six in that video. So again, you need to just explain the strategy, provide some advantages and disadvantages, and then talk about that strategy in the context of its um, impact on the efficiency and the effectiveness of the business. So just the same as before, and then we're going to do this another two times with the other couple of areas of strategies. So here they are again, just restated, just plucked from the uh, study design that we just looked at. So forecasting, master production schedule, materials requirement planning, and just in time. So they're the four we're going to look at. Now, I'm just going to point out right here that if I ever had a choice um, about which strategy I was going to um, use in an answer and kind of any of them could apply the one I'd really try to focus on would be just in time so why they're only really probably writing about forecasting or number two and three there certainly number two and three I would say if they specifically asked me about those particular strategies if I had a choice what I was going to talk about it would be just in time and kind of sort of a similar reason as in the the last video some of those early strategies to me um automation automated production lines and robotics were are so closely related like robotics is kind of a part of an automated production line um a lot of repetition a lot of very very similar really and if you're going to write about both it would be hard not to kind of do some double dipping in terms of what you're saying sort of similar here in a way Forecasting, MPS and MRP, as you'll see, are sort of very, very, they, there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, like certainly MPS and MRP includes an element of forecasting. The MPS includes the MRP. Um, just in time, just kind of stands out as being kind of its own strategy. It's different from the other three. I think it's kind of easier to explain it and talk about some um advantages and disadvantages so look by the end of this video you may agree or disagree i'm going to talk about each of them because you could be asked about um, any of them but for me the one that i would be using if i had the choice would be just in time so first off before we get into those four strategies what is materials management what does that even mean okay it's all about the storage of materials through and the flow uh, storage of materials in a business and the flow through and then out of a business looks at receiving materials from your suppliers in the first place then how we're going to store all those materials and all the inputs work in progress finished product i'll explain though explain those terms in a moment and then finally, it considers how the product is then moved from the point of production to the point of consumption. In other words, how it gets from you, the producer, to the ultimate customer. So in other words, the red, orangey bit there, this is not to use in a answer. This is just me telling you kind of how to visualize it in your head. Um, it's all about ordering stuff, storing stuff, and moving stuff around. Okay, that's materials management in a nutshell. But like I say, don't use that language in an answer that's just for your brain when i say stuff you know ordering stuff storing stuff moving stuff around what are we um talking about 
What is this stuff? I just mentioned a couple of terms that you would have made notes on a minute ago. Let me just explain those, put some context around them. Basically, there's four types of materials that need to be managed in a business. Now, not all of those are going to be involved in all types of businesses, as you'll see in a second. And this job of managing these materials falls to the operations manager. Now, just from a language point of view, this process of materials management can also be called inventory management or stock management. Um, probably you, stock is probably the most commonly used word um, in real life businesses. Inventory, I don't know, slightly posher word if you like for stock. Inventory management, stock management, materials management all means the same thing. Just in case you see that in some case information, worded differently, it all comes back to the same thing basically, okay? Um, so the four types of materials, um, the four types of stuff that I said before, okay? We have our input materials, okay? So remember, when, with the operation system, inputs, process, outputs, we looked at various types of inputs. And so refer back to those notes, but some of those inputs are physical materials. So our raw materials and our component parts, okay? So raw materials um, and component parts being the, the stuff that's kind of already produced by another business that you're going to use as an input in your business. So if you're unsure about raw materials and component parts, refer back to Key Knowledge 2, which was the operation system. We should have some notes explaining what those two things are. Second type of stuff or material that you need to manage is what we call work in progress. So this is unfinished goods. So you imagine we're producing some kind of product. Um, the product moves through stages. So you, again, you go back to your automated production line, for example. Depending on how that automated production line works, it might mean there might be some gaps. So as it moves through the production line, there might be some stages where there's a gap between the next, like before the next stage happens. So there might be the need. And again, this is when I said not all of these materials apply to all businesses, because this certainly wouldn't apply to all businesses. But it might, you might be the type of business where stuff is part produced and then it's stored for a period of time before the, the next stage happens in production. And there might be several stages of work in progress. So definitely wouldn't apply to all businesses, um, but it might apply to certain manufacturing businesses. Finished goods. So this is the stuff that you've built, you've made, you've created, um, but it's not yet been delivered to customers. So it needs to be stored somewhere until your transport, your trucks, whatever it is, takes it away and delivers it to wholesalers, retailers, or wherever it's going to go. Okay, so that's a fairly clear one. And then lastly, usually a much smaller one. And again, it's not going to apply to every business, spare parts for any machinery and equipment that you use as part of your production process. So they're the four types of materials that we're talking about. Usually, though, when we're talking about this stuff um, and these strategies, what we're really referring to is predominantly our input materials. That's what most of this applies to. It can kind of apply and you'll kind of see where the other ones do. But really, most of this is referring to our input materials. So materials management, inventory management, stock management, whatever you want to call it. Like I said before, it's really just all about the storage and the management of all of those things. Now, this is critical because of one key fact, and that is the fact that storage costs money. And that's really important to keep in mind, front and center, as we move through these strategies. Um, and when I say storage costs money, space costs money. So if you need you know, to buy, or if you're renting space just to store stuff, Obviously, there's a cost involved to that. And as you'll see, most of these strategies are about minimizing the need for storage. That's kind of a common theme that's running through this. OK, but fundamentally, all of this comes down to the fact that storage costs money. And that's kind of why that we have these strategies that I'm going to talk about and they can be implemented in our business. So getting into the strategies, OK, material strategy one, forecasting. Okay, forecasting is just analyzing historic data to make informed predictions about future stock requirements. Okay, so we're looking at past sales data to work out how much of the stuff, how much of the ingredients, how much of the inputs we're going to need a particular time 
to make or to produce however much product we need to deliver at a particular time, okay? So analyzing historic data to predict the future, essentially, really just like any type of forecasting works, weather forecasting. I think, I don't know much about weather forecasting. I think it's pretty fancy pants now, but I'm pretty sure there's certainly at least an element of looking at historic information about what the weather has done to predict what is being done in the future. Same idea, any kind of forecasting, forecasting, guesstimating, you know, it's making educated guesses about the future. Okay, forecasting in any context. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, so the operations manager needs to make sure that the right inputs arrive in the right quantities at the right time at the right price from the right source. Okay, it's just one of the responsibilities of the operations manager. So it works, as I kind of just touched on before, by predicting customer demand for your product or your service using past sales data. So you might have seasonal product okay it might sell you might sell more in summer than in winter um, and pr historic sales data tells you that so what you're going to do so say if, say if you sell more in the summer than in the winter you're probably going to be ordering less inputs in winter and more in summer and it's your past sales data that tells you this and then that allows you to predict hopefully more accurately about the amount of inputs you need at any one time to produce however much it is you need to produce for the next kind of period of time, okay? So it allows the operations manager to make the most informed decisions possible. That's kind of the whole point of forecasting, okay? Um, so the most informed decisions possible about the quantities of inputs to order and when they need to arrive, okay? The aim is to not under order. So in other words, you don't have enough stock to fulfill the orders that you have, and then you're gonna be letting customers down because you can't deliver, but also not over order, because then you've got idle stock sitting around in storage, um, which like I said, storage costs money, so that's not a good thing. Um, but even partic more particularly, if the stock you're talking about is perishable. So if you're in a food business and you've got stock coming in, which has a fairly short shelf life, Again, you don't want it sitting around because then there's a chance it'll also go to waste and then you've wasted the money on the stock as well. So forecasting is about getting the balance right, okay? Not overordering, not underordering, just getting it right. Now, not a totally foolproof process as with any types of forecasting. Yeah, the weather forecast you can look at, we all know it's not always accurate, okay? And there's some proper science behind that stuff. Similar with forecasting, okay? Like I said, it's guesstimating, it's making the most informed decision, but you might not always get it right. I'll give you an example of that from my past in a second. Um, further complicated by a couple of factors. Look, there's more factors than this, but just a couple of examples of things that further complicate the process of forecasting. Um, supply lead in time. Okay, suppliers need prior warning of orders. Okay, and you will generally know when you're ordering from your suppliers because you've done it in the past. That, okay, so when I make this order, it's going to take five days to arrive, or it's going to take two weeks to arrive, or it'll arrive tomorrow, whatever it might be. But there might be times when that lead in time is going to change. So you need to make sure you're working really closely with your suppliers so that you have the most up-to-date and accurate information about if that's the case. Because if you're expecting a bunch of stock to come in tomorrow that is gonna allow you to fulfill orders over the next three or four days and their lead time has changed and that stuff doesn't arrive, then you're kind of buggered and uh, it becomes an issue for you because you're not gonna be able to deliver on those orders. Future price changes, again, this is, this is an example of very much um, the business owners, the managers, the operations manager here, keeping a real eye on what's going on in the world around, okay? Prices change, okay? Seasonal variations. So again, if you're in the food business, particularly, you know, fruit and veg, and um, there's gonna be certain times of the year when that fruit or veg is in season, that it is probably gonna be cheaper than when that fruit or veg is out of season. And you need to be aware of that. Now that's something you can predict again using 
um, past sales data and you'll, you'll know the seasonal fluctuations generally if you're in that business. But then things about like changes um, in the value of the Australian dollar, okay? Um, exchange rates, okay? So you understand, I'm assuming all the exchange rate, the value of the Australian dollar when pitched against all the other currencies and exchange rates fluctuate, okay? They don't generally fluctuate hugely in a short period of time, but over the period of time, the exchange rates do change. And other things can be at play in the economy, both in Australia and on a world stage, which can lead to some short term variations in the exchange rate. So what you need to be thinking about is look, um, looking ahead, looking at the predictions, if the exchange rates are likely to change. So in other words, if the Australian dollar is likely to become weaker or stronger in the next month or whatever, it might be wise to order more now because in two weeks time, three weeks time, four weeks time, um, it's gonna cost you more if you're ordering from overseas. So this is if you're getting your inputs from overseas, obviously. If the Australian dollar changes in value, in three weeks time, those same inputs might cost you more or less than what they would if you ordered them today. So again, it's worth being across all of these kind of things. You've got to keep your eyes on lots of different factors and work out um, the best time to order based on these things. Now, advantages and disadvantages, like we did with the technology strategies. So with forecasting, the advantages are, look, the, you're making the most informed decisions possible about the input quantities that you need um, in order to meet your customer demand. Okay, pretty straightforward. Also prevents I, um, excessive amounts of idle stock um, needing to be stored. And again, I touched on before, particularly for perishable items that may then be wasted as well. Okay, and thirdly, reduces storage costs, which is kind of comes out of both of those things, really. Okay, so there's some key advantages of forecasting. Um, some disadvantages: look, if a business is too reliant on forecasting, um, and there is a sudden or unexpected increase in demand, and you're just going on this past historic data that you've been using, then it might may lead to you not having enough stock in hand and not being able to. And produce enough to meet demand in the short run. So there's a risk. Um, historical data, market trends might not always reflect future demand. Okay, so again, like I keep saying, you're, you're making your best guess. Think about your footy team, right? You play for a footy team and you're playing the team from down the road and you've beat them in the last 10 games, okay? You, you would predict that you're going to beat them again, okay, based on What's gone, past, what's gone past before, based on history, based on the trend, you would probably forecast that you're going to beat them again. But you know what? On the day, maybe you have a crappy game. They play an absolute blinder. They might win. Okay, so suddenly your forecast has not paid off. So same sort of deal with this stuff. And ultimately, uh, I guess kind of because of those two things, um, if you if you have under ordered because there's been suddenly a spike in demand for your product that you didn't foresee it might actually lead to a production halt okay production halt is really bad because it means suddenly you can produce no product and there's a very definite delay to your customers and that's really not a good look then that leads to a decrease in customer satisfaction possibly future sales future profits so on and so forth so that you really really do not want to under forecast to the point where you actually have to halt your own production. Really, really bad look. Um, now, impact on efficiency and effectiveness, again, because that's how the study design is worded. And again, like with the technology strategies, the stuff you see here isn't new. It's just kind of restating it, repackaging it in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, so you have something for your notes that you can use and learn for the purposes of answering questions that are specifically focused on E and D. So the impact on efficiency decrease the likelihood of over or under ordering stock, therefore optimizing the use of your resources, reducing wastage, minimizing the risk of halts in productions, thereby increasing efficiency. And don't forget, if you're asked about the impact on efficiency, you need to round it off at the end by finishing with efficiency. Okay, so again, it's a series of steps, logical steps that gets you from here to here. And the the last place you end up is at its efficiency. You need to mention that specifically. Impact and effectiveness proves the abilities 
uh, the business's rather ability to meet customer demand leads to increasing customer satisfaction, sales, market share, thereby increasing its effectiveness. Because again, effectiveness is the ability of a business's or the degree of ability of a business to meet objectives. Okay, so sales and market share increases are key objectives, hence that. Okay, so look, I'm just going to throw in this example here um, just to kind of um, maybe put some real life around some of this stuff. Um, Maccas, so go back oh, 20, 25 years, whatever it was. Okay, so I'm working in a Maccas Corporation back in the UK. Um, there's kind of four um, types of stock that basically you store, okay? Top left there, you see the buns, okay? So they come um, fresh from a bakery not too far away, and they come like you see that in pallets. Um, there were four types of buns. There were regular buns, which for your cheeseburgers, your hamburgers, there were Big Mac buns, there were quarter pound of buns, and then there were chicken sandwich buns, which chicken sandwich, I don't think you actually have in Australia. It's a classic McDonald's um, chicken patty, deep fried, lettuce, mayo, the bun. It's kind of an elongated bun. Anyway, four types of buns. Then you have top right there is your, is your walk-in freezer. That's where your frozen stuff is stored, which predominantly is your meat patties, for the different types of burger and your nuggets and your frozen um, chicken and frozen fish. Um, ice cream, I guess, stuff like that. Predominantly, it's your meat and poultry products in there. Bottom right is your walk-in chiller. So your sauces, your salad stuff, ugh, that kind of thing, anything that needs to be chilled. And then the bottom left is your dry stock, your paper cups, your, I'm going to say, happy meals, the, the the cups that the burgers come in, sorry, the, the, the little cartons that the burgers come in, all of, this, all of the, the packaging, basically. Now, in terms of forecasting, because forecasting is a, a huge thing, and look, this does all happen by computer these days, but same kind of uh, theory applies. The only tricky one really was the buns. Um, and in my years, well, three years or so working at Maccas, there was a few occasions where we would literally run out of buns. Frozen stuff would never happen because the, the shelf life and that stuff is something like three months. There's such a long lead time. You could kind of over order and you'd run it down. You would never get to your last couple of boxes. There was no, you didn't need to because it's such a long shelf life. You over order a bit. Okay. It's not a drama. Chilled, similar. Chilled stuff generally had a shelf life for five to seven days, some of it a bit longer. But again, you had some flexibility there. The dry stuff really wasn't a drama because it kind of lasts forever. The buns was the issue though. The buns, when they arrived in store, um, had a shelf life for three days. So if they were not used within three days, you had to throw them out. Obviously, you don't want to be throwing stock out. Um, now, there's not much storage for buns. Basically, you'll find in the average Maccas, the buns are stored down some random corridor, like maybe between the kitchen and the drive through or something. There's not really allocated storage. It's kind of storing when you can. So you, you don't have a lot of room. Um, so you can't store tons of buns. But you also don't want to store tons of buns because you've got to use them within three days. The idea is now with, with the buns, we would get three deliveries a week. Okay. So every two days, and then I guess the third one would be every third day. So you're getting constant smaller deliveries of buns. And the idea is you'd get, I don't know, so you had 50 pallets of regular buns. If you were getting this right, by the time the next delivery came in the two or three days time, you would now be down to your last two or three pallets. Okay, and then the next delivery comes, you top up, and then you start again. That's kind of how it works. Now, there were occasions when, yeah, we actually under-ordered and we'd actually run out of, say, regular buns, um, say, at lunchtime on a Tuesday. The delivery is not coming until the Wednesday morning, and it meant you had to take cheeseburgers and hamburgers off the menu for the rest of the Tuesday and, and on the Wednesday until the delivery came. So yeah, d d um, items with a short shelf life, this is kind of more tricky with, um, and every now and again, you are gonna kind of get it wrong. Okay, so hopefully that sort of makes some sense to you. All right, the second strategy, MPS, material, uh, sorry, master production schedule. Document that basically sets out what a business intends to produce in what quantities, when, um, it breaks down production into the stages that it happens in, and it creates output targets based on, again, predicted customer demand. So based on forecasts, this is what I'm saying. There's some kind of overlap between these things. 
The ops manager then uses that information to work out what inputs, materials, machinery, labor, etc., are required for each stage of the process. And this is a thing. This is why it's a little bit more than forecasting in terms of material inputs. This now includes all of your other inputs as well, the machinery, the labor and stuff. So this is kind of a bit more holistic than just forecasting. But forecasting is certainly plays a role in this. Now, certain information needs to be put into the system to produce the NPS. So things like current stock levels, how much you have in stock right now, and you would actually do a stock count um, to work that out. You'd physically go around and count how many of each thing that you have, how many orders you have currently, and what you're forecasting your future sales over the next period of time to be as well. You kind of get all that information, you put it into the system, and it can produce the NPS for you. So you think of this as kind of like a complete guide to production. Again, not for an answer, but just in my head, you know, this is kind of like your overall guide of how you're producing, what you're producing, when you're producing it, what inputs you, what every type of input you need um, for the process, so on and so forth. So a complete guide to, to production. Look, there's just some examples. Basically, NPS is just spreadsheets essentially so that this is just some extracts of larger mps's it's just spreadsheets with numbers in which give the production manager or the operations manager and um, the information they need to make sure everything kind of happens smoothly and efficiently okay so you don't need to be looking at the detail of that but just to give you a, a visual of what we're talking about with an mps spreadsheets the advantages of using our NPS, and again, this is where things get kind of repetitive because it's really similar to forecasting. Again, reduces the risk of overproducing um, that can lead to waste, again, particularly with perishable outputs. Um, also leads to reduced environmental impact, um, hence an improvement in reputation and increase in sales. Any decrease in waste is a good thing, obviously, for the environment, which then leads to better reputation, better reputation leads to more sales, so on and so forth. Um, second one, sets a clear schedule for the employees, which provides them a great awareness of what they need to be doing. Like I said, it's a complete guide to production. So it kind of breaks everything down. So each employee kind of knows what part they play and exactly what they need to do as part of the process. Less chance of production halts, just like we're forecasting. And again, like forecasting, much more likely to meet customer demand. Disadvantages, um, potentially limited impact in a business that is constantly changing the operation system because it might not be flexible enough. You know, your NPS is it's not completely rigid, but it's kind of rigid for a period of time. And if your operation system is constantly evolving, constantly changing, constantly going up and down, there may be some limited um, ability for this to kind of be of some help. Um, Probably more importantly, and probably the first one I'd come up with would be implementing and maintaining a master production schedule can be expensive. It's software. Like any software, there's a cost to it. This particular software is pretty complex. It'll be pretty expensive to buy, to buy um, then license ongoing and to maintain. Once again, impact and efficiency and effectiveness. I'm not going to talk through those. They're on the screen for you. Nothing that I haven't really talked about already. And again, there's some repetition from forecasting. So that's pretty straightforward. Moving on to the third strategy, materials requirement plan. And again, it's kind of more of the same, really. The MRP is a computerized inventory management system. So in other words, kind of a computerized stock management and forecasting system. This is why, you know, forecasting is part of this and this is part of MPS. This is why I'm not, not a big fan of the way the study design set these out, but anyway, it is what it is. So the MRP, computerized stock management system, it schedules and places your materials orders, okay? Widely used by manufacturers around the world, not just manufacturers, restaurants, McDonald's been using it for many years. A demand oriented system, relying on data from orders and from forecasting. Okay, again, forecasting. It creates a very detailed plan of the exact materials needed at any one time in, other to, in order to meet your production targets. So operations managers need to know how much material they have in stock and how long it's gonna take for deliveries to arrive 
And then the MRP will work out how much it needs to order and when. And generally these days actually place the order as well. So it kind of removes humans from the entire process. So it's all done on a computer. Okay, so the advantages, um, same as before, minimizes waste, therefore environmental impact, reduces storage costs, minimizes production halts. Disadvantages as before, okay? They're there, nothing new here. Same with the impact on efficiency and effectiveness, more repetition. So this is the thing, whilst there's a lot of repetition, but just be careful with that, that you're kind of repeating the right parts of this. Um, so with your notes, you can kind of learn some of this together, but make sure you're kind of taking the right bits and you understand it enough that when you need to come up with advantages, disadvantages, impacts on efficiency and effectiveness, you're kind of choosing the right bits as opposed to not bits that do apply to that particular one. If that makes some sense. Right, strategy four. This is my favorite one, just in time. Okay, so just in time is a system that was invented um, in the early 50s onwards um, by Toyota, okay? Um, the Toyota manufacturing system is famous worldwide and many, many other businesses have replicated it in the time since. Now it's pretty much standard in manufacturing all over the world and not even just manufacturing other types of businesses as well. Okay, so the whole premise behind the just-in-time system, okay, is that the system eliminates waste and storage costs by having all operations completed just in time, just in time, for the next stage to commence and all raw materials and parts to arrive at that time as well, okay? Might make some sense to you there, but as we go through this, I think it will make some more sense to you. Okay, so this is actually a methodology or a production model, unlike the other three, okay? So items are created to meet demand, not created in surplus or created in advance of need, okay? This approach speeds up, um, speeds up product delivery, increases efficiency and reduces costs, okay? So to make this work, okay, so the idea being, Rather than just ordering tons and tons of inputs and then kind of using over a period of time, you know what your production is going to be. So you just have smaller deliveries, smaller, more regular deliveries of input materials. And pretty much as soon as they arrive, they're used in the production. Okay. So smaller, but more regular deliveries of input materials reduces the amount of material kept in stocks. So we're doing smaller and pretty much as soon, if this is working properly, as soon as it arrived, arrives, it, it's used. So stock is delivered just before it is required in a production process, hence the term just in time. Also eliminates waste and storage costs by having all the operations completed just in time for the next stage to commence. Remember before I mentioned working progress by about how in a manufacturing process, there might be some product that is kind of, you know, one, one aspect is done to it, then it's sitting around waiting for the next stage to happen. You need to store that work in progress with just in time, you would eliminate that. Okay. So as everything happens, it just, if it, it moves on from one stage to the next, and there are no delays, no gaps, no waiting. It just moves smoothly from one stage to the next. So therefore it reduces the need to store work in progress. And then only just enough finished product is also held to meet immediate demands. So at every stage of the process, the inputs, work in progress, the output, you're kind of minimizing all of that. So as soon as a product is finished, it shipped straight down to customers. You're not storing it in your warehouse for days, weeks, months on ends until it gets shipped out. As soon as it comes up to the production line, it's gone. Okay. So hopefully you're kind of getting a picture of how this works. Look, a really, really simplified example just to put some numbers around it to give you an idea. Furniture manufacturing business uses 300 tons a month of pine in the manufacture of its products. Rather than ordering and receiving 300 tons once a month, so at the beginning of the month it gets the 300 tons, and then storing it and then using it and running that 300 tons down through the month, 
The just-in-time system might involve instead having 15 deliveries a month, one every two days, of just 20 tonnes. And then that product gets used pretty quickly. And then you're never storing more than 20 tonnes. That's going to be cheaper, obviously, than storing 300 tonnes. Cheaper, meaning more efficient. Um, so you get how that works. So small, regular deliveries, the stuff get used up pretty quickly. So you get a small delivery, it gets used up, small delivery gets used up rather than getting the big delivery and then slowly working your way through it. Actual numbers there would be based on sales forecasts, but that's just a really simplified version to kind of hopefully you can picture it in your mind. Now, just in time, you might have already thought of this, places a really, really heavy reliance on the supplies of your inputs. If you're operating just in time and a supplier lets you down, so in other words, can't fulfill an order or can't deliver as much as you need or delivers late, that can then lead to a halt in your own production because you're running things so tight. You know, you've got these small quantities coming that you're going to use. It might lead to you actually not having enough inputs in stock to actually carry on producing because you're only holding enough, the minimum amount to meet the demand that you are producing for. So it's kind of risky. So sourcing the right suppliers to partner with is an absolutely essential element in this system working. Now with suppliers, generally speaking, you know, you're looking for the cheapest supplies you can find for your products. Obviously it's a balance with quality, but if you're operating in just in time, there's going to be another critical aspect of your supplier choice, and that's how reliable they are. Okay. Probably going to be worth paying a bit more for your supplies if the supplier is reliable rather than going to a cheaper supplier that might let you down every now and again, because that can really, really lead to big issues in your own business. Look, there was a case, um, I reckon it was now 10 or 15 years ago in Victoria, when when Victoria had a car manufacturing business, there was a big Toyota plant, a big Holden plant and a big Ford plant all around Melbourne. Um, now, I mentioned in an early video that car manufacturers do not make all of the stuff that goes into and on their cars. I can't remember exactly what the product was. I've got a feeling it was the, um, the little interior mirror. Okay, they let you look through the rear windscreen, something like that, something as random as that. Um, but there was another factory in Victoria, I think it might have been Geelong. Um, their business was producing, let's say it was these mirrors. Okay, so it's producing these interior mirrors. And they actually supplied all three of the car plants in Victoria. So the Ford plant, the Holden plant, and the Toyota plant. Okay, those companies did not make their own mirrors. Now, those car plants, I said Toyota invented just in time. So they were definitely using just in time, but all car manufacturing plants around the world now use just in time as well. So they were all operating this system. Now, what happened? There was some industrial dispute at this factory in Geelong producing the wing mirrors, um, and it led to strike action and the workers went on strike and it meant no product was being produced for a week or two. That meant that Ford, Holden, Toyota, ultimately ended up also standing down thousands of workers because they couldn't complete their cars because they didn't have enough of these mirrors in stock to finish the cars because they were operating just in time. They were getting deliveries, small frequent deliveries, just in time um, for them to be you know, bolted on in the production process. Um, and it meant they couldn't finish the cars while this factory, this factory basically let them down um, so this is an, an example of how risky just in time can be. You're relying on your suppliers that much that it's really important that you partner with reliable suppliers. Okay, advantages. Look, similar to before, minimizing waste, therefore environment in, environmental impact, reducing storage costs. Okay, nothing particularly new there. Um, another one though, which is kind of um, more specific to just in time, it also allows a business to change production to a different product without wasting resources because there's minimal resources on hand to use up anyway. So actually, if you need to change production to do a different product for any reason, it just allows you to be a bit more flexible with that because you don't have tons of this stuff sitting around to use up before you do it. Disadvantages. Like I just said before, complete reliability on suppliers. Suppliers fail to deliver the correct materials at the right time. Production can come to a complete halt. If customer demand suddenly and unexpectedly increases, 
again, the business might fail to meet that custom demand because you've got a lack of reserves of stock, which can then damage the business reputation. So again, we've seen that one before with earlier strategies. Another one, which um, so maybe um, more specific, we made to just in time, there might be less time to quality check the stock um, because it's being used as soon as it arrives. Like if this just in time is working really well, as soon as stuff arrives, it's being used, which doesn't give you too much time, too much opportunity to actually quality check your inputs. So there's definitely a potential issue. And another one, um, specific to just in time, Bulk buying, discounts, you will be aware that just in life, not just not a business, but a person, like when you bulk buy stuff, you pay less per unit. So you buy stuff for cheaper when you bulk buy, okay? So if you are going to do these more frequent, smaller orders, it might be that you might not attract some of those bulk buying discounts that you might otherwise do than if you were ordering a huge amount in one time. OK, might not be the case because you're still ordering the same amount over the long run. It's just more frequent deliveries, but the supplier might prefer to, to just deliver large amounts. It's just something to think about. So I wouldn't say you definitely gonna lose those discounts, but there is a risk. But definitely delivery costs increase because you're now having many more deliveries than you were originally. So that's probably a cost that is going to increase. Efficiency, effectiveness, I'm not going to talk through that. Again, it's on the screen. That's pretty straightforward. Again, nothing new in there. Restating the stuff that we've already talked about. So I'm going to leave that one to make your own notes. And that is basically materials management. Okay. So again, once again, we've gone through the same process. And in the next Kinoj dot point, which is quality, we're going to do the same. There's three strategies there. So we're going to get, get in the habit. This is what you need. Explain the strategy. Give me some advantages. Give me some disadvantages so you can discuss it. Of course, you might need to compare the strategies. Um, and then finally, the impact on efficiency and effectiveness, because that is what the study design, that's how it's worded. So it's likely that questions are going to be framed in that way. So that's it for this one. I will see you in the next video, Kinoj 6 quality. Cheers for now.